Thank you. Enjoy your evening. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the host of Dogma Debate, David Smalley. Thank you. Thank you for being here, and most of all, thank you for pretending to give a shit that I was the one that walked out on stage just now. <laughs> I'm so excited to be here. It's an honor to be here. It's my first time in Canada. And 
I'm loving it. I'm loving it. I'm excited to be here, and I'm excited to bring some very nice folks out on stage. So thank you and welcome to a celebration of science and reason. We're going to be talking for about one hour up here, and then we're going to do about 30 minutes or so of your questions. So the mics will be placed toward the middle, and you'll be coming up and asking questions at that time. So uh, think ahead for any questions you may have. And then after the show this evening, there's going to be, Sam is going to be signing books uh, downstairs in the lower lobby. And there's merch, of course, in the upstairs lobby where I will be and, and Sarah will kind of probably be floating around both because uh, we'd love to meet you folks. And so hopefully you can stick around for that. Okay. Um, I want to bring someone out on stage who's very special. She's very awesome. She's great to talk to, very informative. Please give a welcome to the co-founder of Ex-Muslims of North America, Sarah Hader. <laughs> this next young man you may have heard of, I believe he's an up-and-coming, aspiring writer. He hopes to make it someday. Of course I'm joking. He's uh, phenomenally successful in, as an author, as a podcaster, as a scientist. It's my honor to introduce to you tonight, Sam Harris. I think they like you a little bit. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm amazed, and uh, I don't think I'll ever take it for granted that, that people actually show up. Uh, so um, thank you for coming. Thank you for the, and I'm sorry for the delay, and it's an honor to be here. I don't think I've, actually, it's not true. I've spoken once in Toronto before, but um, it's not a city I get to often, so it's really, I'm really happy to be here. Absolutely. I'm so excited to be here. Let's get it started. Let's do it. All right. Yes, ma'am. I'm on it. So uh, I, we do have several things we want to cover, so I do want to jump right in here. Let's first talk about uh, the political extremes that we see right now. We see sort of this combination almost of far left, far right, this ideologue mentality of extremes. What are your thoughts on, on exactly how polarizing that is and how did we get here? Um, well, it, it certainly seems like something has shifted. I, I, I guess I can speak more for the country to the south of your, your border than, than for Canada, but it seems like the internet has changed everything, and voices, no matter how fringe and crazy, get amplified in ways that, that they didn't used to. So it's, um, uh, I think we're seeing the extremes more and more, and, and there's a kind of a normalizing of the extremity. And in the case of what's happened in the U.S. politically, it, it's you know again I've, I've complained about this to everyone's uh, exhaustion on my podcast, but it's just you know what we what we've witnessed politically in the U.S. I would have thought was impossible. So now I'm just uh, now I'm just surprised at my my continual capacity for surprise. <laughs> No, nothing surprises. Nothing should surprise me anymore. I mean, we'll we'll elect uh, someone without a head. <laughs> Sarah, what is your take on on how the activists have actually been able to construct the narrative rather than I don't know the the general population? Well, I think it's interesting the way that we're approaching this idea of truth that instead of the fact that there might be just an objective reality that we can all reason ourselves into and we can speak to each other and have conversations and get to a productive place where we both agree, there's this idea that there's just a, a political narrative that's competing with another political narrative. 
And I've seen this, in particular, Islam is uh, a place where this is super visible and it's easy for anyone to see how you can, how um, one side of the political, you know, the political aisle views Islam in a particular way and that is the narrative that they accept. Um, the sad part is, is that reality li lies somewhere in the middle and political motivations often blind the way that we uh, see the world and instead we should be you know, losing uh, those and trying to adopt a more rational, more compassionate way of looking at the world. For sure. And do you think that the way the media covers this stuff has anything to do with it? I mean, they're more interested, it seems, in sensationalizing for ratings and things like that than they are presenting the, the, the true sides of, of the issues. You know, I think we witnessed that, the, the, the real danger of that in the presidential election, because they, the media clearly wanted to cover it as a horse race up until the last possible moment, and that entailed giving equal scrutiny to truly incompatible uh, errors on both sides. So the, 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 the fixation on, on Clinton's emails, for instance, which happened you know, up, up until the 11th hour, was in the service of giving some kind of, uh, just some sort of suspense to this. Because I, actually, I know people in the media, I, I, again, it's, it's uh, painful to, to relitigate the presidential election, but I know people who were anchoring news broadcasts the, you know, the night of, waiting for these election returns, and they were told in advance that Clinton wins in a landslide. So everything you saw on television that night from you know, like five o'clock Eastern on was news anchors pretending to be in suspense about what was gonna happen, being absolutely sure that Clinton was going to win. And then when things turned, you know, around eight o'clock or so, uh, people were just completely Blindsided, they had no idea what was what they were doing. We're in Canada, so maybe they don't know. Guys, we had this crazy election. <laughs> it was nuts down there. <laughs> Before we get off the that that topic, I just want to address the right side of politics. And I don't mean correct. I mean the right, the the, the extreme right. Um, do you think the religious right is still making ground? in politics? Well, they're doing it, in the U.S., they're now doing it under the cover of, of Trump and, and the, and the, the non-religious right, or the, or the, you know, the intolerant right that isn't necessarily uh, thumping Bibles while they, while they express their intolerance. So the, the, there's no question that the, the Christian right in the U.S. has made huge gains politically, but they're, they're doing it fairly under the radar. Uh, because because Trump has just catered to their uh, to their you know, basically every every demand in in, in uh, return for their support. So, you think that he's been so extreme in some areas that it's easy for them to slide in some of their legislation? I mean, I know there's this, the recent thing where um, they're they're sort of allowing churches in America now to uh, donate directly to to politicians anonymously and. It's kind of a scary thing, but it's not making the news because of all the other crazy stuff he's saying and tweeting. So yeah. he's almost like a big distraction for real things that are going on. Well, well it's a bad sign that even I can't care about it. <laughs> you know, it's like, I, mean, I, I can't think, I, the fact that I would want Mike Pence to be president, given, <laughs> I mean, that, that is the implication of every moment I spend trying to undermine Trump and get him impeached. <laughs> Uh, I, I seem to want a Christian theocrat in the White House. <laughs> you can all thank me when that happens. <laughs> but yeah, it's, a, it's just, it's sort of like, you know, it's Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, it's, and survival <laughs> somewhere. Uh, once you get, you gotta get survival worked out before you worry about whether they teach evolution as a controversial topic. <laughs> Sarah? I think the, the most, uh, what, we, what I was saying earlier, I'll just build on that with one example that it, I've been thinking about for the, since it happened, uh, right after President Donald Trump <coughs> was elected, there were quite a few uh, hate crime incidences, and these were just reported in breathlessly by the media, um, especially those occurring to women who were visibly Muslim women who wore the hijab. 
And quite a few, it turned out later, were actually hoaxes. Um, that it didn't actually happen, the woman made it up for one reason or another. And it was interesting to me to see on my just own personal social media feeds who reported the, who shared with their own friends and family the, the news of the woman who, get who got attacked and then who shared afterwards when they found out that it was a hoax. And it's, it was so neatly divided into political camps that there was a certain kind of person, maybe liberal leaning, who almost wanted to hear about this event. It was almost as if they were waiting for something like this to happen uh, the second Donald Trump was elected. So this fed into exactly how they saw the world to be, and then they shared that, that news post. And then afterwards, when it turned out to be a hoax, some people on the right who don't feel too favorably uh, about Muslims uh, found that this, I, the, the fact that it was a hoax fed into their feelings that you know Muslims aren't really people who suffer any kind of bigotry um, in the United States. And it was just this, ter the story itself was this woman, this one woman um, in New York City who was, a, who was attacked. She said that she was attacked um, or uh, you know, so, so harassed in some way by three Donald Trump supporters and she filed a police, a police uh, bias report. Um, and it turned out later that it was a hoax. What the, the part of the story that a lot of people didn't focus on and didn't think about was the fact that the woman lied because uh, she was being forced by her dad to live a certain way. She was a hijabi woman, she was dating a Christian guy, she wanted to go out late, she broke her curfew, she wanted an excuse uh, that she could tell her father about that he might believe, so in order to get out of it, she made up this, this incident. And the, I mean, the terrible thing was, the heartbreaking thing was for me, is to see certain kinds of media outlets report things in different ways, but almost no one caught the real story, which was that there, here's a woman who's probably being, you know, he's, she's being forced into living a life that she doesn't want to live. Later, you see these pictures of her um, in the court uh, with her head shaved. Her family had forced her to shave her head. Um, so clearly there was something going on, but who's paying attention to, to that story? Speaking of Islam, you guys mind if we get into that for just a moment? Um, I, I had Gad Saad on my podcast, and, and he's very outspoken, of course, about this topic, and, and we, we got into this idea of uh, Islam reformation. Do you believe that's possible to reform Islam to be more, I guess, in a way like Christianity and where people hold their beliefs, but no one's... I'm not going to say no one. Very few people are out trying to physically force these things to happen by force and instead are, are much more moderate about it. Is it possible to, to introduce an idea of Islam that is reformed? Well, actually, Sam, I want to know where you are with this right now because I know some of your ideas have shifted since your conversation with Majid Nawaz. So where do you, where do you stand on this issue? Well, I guess I would distinguish between what... I hope will happen and what I think is likely in any kind of time frame that we can be uh, consoled by. You know, I, I clearly, I hope it's reformable and it's, uh, and I don't really, I mean, this is Majid's line. I, I, you probably, most of you probably know who Majid Nawaz is, but he was my, briefly, he was my collaborator on this book, Islam and the Future of Tolerance. And it started out sort of as a debate, but then we converged on a lot of uh, points and you know his line is l l listen if you think uh, reform is hard just think of what it would take for 1.6 billion Muslims to apostatize and become atheists I mean that, that's clearly a higher bar so it, 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 reform is the easier project however hard it, it might be um, the problem and I think this is what more where you sit is that in, in arguing for atheism, intellectually, ethically, you're standing on very firm ground. It's very straightforward to argue for why you, sh you know, shouldn't think the Quran or any other book was dictated by the creator of the universe. Uh, to argue for reform, to argue that, to, to accept the claim that the Quran is the word of God, or could well be the word of God, but then to try to parse various passages in ways that are more benign, that, strangely, is a, is a harder project intellectually. It seems, and, and you're always at a disadvantage with uh, 
against the fundamentalists or you know the, the Islamists or the jihadists or you know, people who are really taking every line seriously, uh, you're at a disadvantage because you're not picking and choosing based on anything other than your modern decision about how you want to live. You're not, it's not God who's informing your, your hermeneutics of the Quran, it's your preferences. And you know, the, the whole point of religion is to confound your preferences on some level. Your preferences are gonna lead you to hell if you believe this stuff. <laughs> uh, so I, so you, I, you know, I, I think that's, um, I, mean, I, I agree with both of you, or I mean, both of you sound do you agree with Majid in the point that uh, it's more likely to see reformation? Well, it's, it's definitely a heavier lift. Again, it's more it's it's easier for for anyone who's honest, I think, to argue for the, the atheist line rather than the reform line. But I, when you look at just the, when, again the analogy to Christianity seems relevant. When you look at what's happened to Christianity, it it has clearly been moderated. Even you know, even our fundamentalists are nothing like the fundamentalists of the 14th century, and so the, and uh, granted, we don't have hundreds of years to wait around for for Islam to get its act together. But uh, there's some it's clearly some historical cultural process that can mitigate the the, the worst parts of a religion, uh, even among the fundamentalists. And and so that's and that's the thing that I think Majid is is arguing for. Well, I think the the assumption that what you need is 1.6 billion Muslims or whatever it is to apostatize uh, is is not a correct one. That's not what you need in order to have that change. You just need enough of them to feel uh, doubtful about the religion, enough doubt that they can at least concede that there is another truth out there. Um, there's a phrase that I hear pretty commonly, you know, when I speak to Li uh, liberal Christians or Catholics or Jews even, well, they say something like, uh, I'm a Christian, but, and the but would follow some way in which they, they separate themselves from what they see as a uh, common Christian practice or something that's inherent within Christianity. That's a very common thing that I hear among Christians and Jews. I don't hear that very often uh, among Muslims. Instead, what you see is Islam has always been a humanist religion. Islam has always been a liberal uh, religion. And so let's bring it back to its progressive liberal roots, which is a very, it's a, it's a very different argument. And it's important to see the differences in those arguments. To say, I'm a Christian, but you know I believe in gay rights, is to acknowledge that while you are a Christian and while you follow certain aspects of this faith and you identify it or whatever, um, you don't ultimately think that it's infallible. You think that it is possible to disagree with your faith, and th you think it's po also possible that your own reason and your own moral judgment can get you there. So that's a really important difference, something that we don't see very much in Muslim reform movements. Instead, it's a call for, well, Islam always was this way, and in fact, the roots of Islam were this way, this sort of historical revisionism that you know, and, and weird interpretations to try and get Islam to fit modern human rights instead of just saying, well, you know, it, it doesn't fit, in fact, um, but I find some value in it, and here are the ways in which I, in which I depart from it. Yeah, I mean, uh, the clearest case, and again, I'm, I'm just following Majid here, but the, there, there are clear passages in the Quran that cannot be reinterpreted, and the, and the one that Majid always cites is cutting the hand of a thief. Right, so I mean, that's not a, a metaphor. It's not an allegory. It's not. A, I mean, it's just. There's nothing to to think about that other than God wants you to cut the the, the hands of a thief off. Uh, and Majid doesn't try to reinterpret that or say that the, you know that Islam used to be so enlightened that it would never practice that. It's just. It's just. It is incompatible with the way we want to live, and we have to. You know, God has to lose that particular argument. Uh, <laughs> So, and I, I think that, so I think when push comes to shove, you, you have to do that, but the hope is that there's enough gymnastics you can do with, with some of the other stuff that, that is amenable to being reinterpreted uh, to make it benign. Well, there, there's something about that, but that's also a little bit, uh, it's, it's creepy to me in some way that you sort of have to uh, revise, you know, pretend like you never thought otherwise, and now you see Islam as this liberal thing, 
and tomorrow when our human rights and you know moral judgment moves some, somewhere further, progresses further, you have to pretend like you never thought that it aligned with the 21st century and instead is now aligning with whatever future date. So there's this weird revisionism and there's a weird sense of lying to yourself to make something happen that really isn't something that's happening naturally. And I can't imagine that that's productive to rational thought. I can't imagine that that's a healthy way for people in a society to think about you know, yeah. this incredibly important aspect of, of the world. No, I would agree. I mean, this is, this, this is the, the politics of emergency. You know, this is not ideal on any level. But it might be that there is no, there is no long-term solution. And uh, it might be that a long-term solution, or sorry, uh, there is no short-term solution. That there is, if there is a solution, it's, it's long-term and it'll happen slowly. Um, but we need to be doing it the right way. We need to be doing it in a way where it can actually last. Um, but if you're, or last, at, at the very least, last an intellectual challenge, which some of these, you know, uh, sort of ridiculous gymnastics that you have to play to get one word to mean another word um, are not going to last that. And we just have to, we're just sort of hoping that a strong force like ISIS doesn't come around, that some charismatic demagogue doesn't come around uh, in a hundred years who can convince people that, hey, these, just read the Quran, read it yourself and see what it says and see the plain truth and come back to the, this true fundamentalist faith. Yeah, yeah. And it yeah, in defense of your side, Islam is different than Christianity in that respect. It, it, the, the opportunity to come back and say, here are the fundamentals, there's, no, there's, there's absolutely no reason to deviate from them, and then to sort of reboot something like ISIS, that is, is, is much more straightforward and you could even argue inevitable with Islam, given, just given the nature of the doctrine. Uh, with Christianity, it's harder because it, there, it, a lot of the pressure gets released with just the basic message of Jesus that you know he's he's not there to fulfill the law, right? I mean, like there's a fundamental transcendence of all the barbarous stuff in the Old Testament, and what you're left with is if you're left with a with a fair amount that you you would rather not have, but it's not I mean, even the craziest Christian cults are still just, at their worst, waiting around for the world to end. They're not actively <laughs> bringing it about. And, and that's, that's a difference that, that uh, causes me to sleep better at night. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, I, I know that there, there's been some, some concern around that because if you look back through history, any time there's ever been some hard, rigid, you must stop doing this religiously, it just turns into a ton of bloodshed. You know, but the, the reform that has happened, for example, in Christianity has been very slow and a lot of people died in the process. You know, we obviously, like you said, Sam, we, we can't wait around for that. Mm. So what do we do? And I think maybe conversations like this, books like what you're doing, uh, the obvious important work that you're doing with ex-Muslims of North America, that's why that is so important, I think, is because I think that's the way we get there is through education and public discourse. Yeah, yeah, and, and the, the point you made, which Majid makes as well, is that if you could just inject 1% of doubt in the mind of someone who would otherwise be a jihadist, you know, that, that uh, doubt, is, doubt is good, and however you can get it in there, whether it's through a project like yours or a reform project, it, if, you, if you're just le left with a feeling that maybe this isn't the perfect path to paradise, that that's enough when you're talking about canceling the worst behavior. I guess I would only I would only disagree to say that I don't think all forms of doubt are 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 the same in the sense that there's a there's what Majid is sort of aiming towards, which is we just reinterpret things and we put enough doubt in a, one interpretation that oh you know, maybe all these interpretations can be valid in the interpretation that says that when when you, a man has a right to beat his wife it actually means he. You should tickle his wife instead. I mean, if there's, those are not. Also a bad practice, but <laughs> <laughs> arguably not as bad. Yeah, and, and, and Gad was talking about how some are, are saying that instead of saying, they're taking the words that say kill, and say no, kill them with love or kill them with kindness. I think, I think right. this is a, these are actual arguments people are making 
for this reformation idea. And I think it's absurd to expect people to, to take them all seriously because there are times when the scripture is more explicit than other times. And in, 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 with the verse that I was talking about, that a husband has a, has a right to discipline his wife, it's really hard, around, hard to get around that. And at the very least, even if he doesn't have a right to hit her, he just has the right to hit her lightly with a stick. I mean, there's so many different ways that people try to you know, get themselves, you know, into a, to a more liberal position there. Um, but it, the underlying uh, idea is that a husband has a right to discipline his wife, you know, yeah. be it by, you know, scolding her, be it by, you know, walking away or whatever it is, he has the right to do that. That's the underlying idea and that doesn't go away. And when I'm talking about, uh, you know, when I'm trying to advocate for women's rights or human rights, I don't want to start with that and try to mold that into something that is super feminist and, you know. Yeah, th there's no way to, to soften those words to come to a compromise. That just needs to be called out for what it is. Right, so I think that's what you're getting at. Yeah, so to the extent that we should have doubt, we should have doubt in the truth of the claim altogether, in the truth of the message altogether. That's the doubt that's powerful. That's a doubt that can last. Yeah, but I think the fundamental claim that you want to undermine any way you can is this notion that revelation makes sense, the idea that certain books were dictated by an omniscient being. You have that, that is the, the foundation for all of these religions, and the moment you... You, you lose your purchase on that, then you're, then all the other dogmatisms that follow from that get weakened. So I think, and that unfortunately, as you know, in the Muslim world, that the, the certainty of, of the validity of that claim is, is, you know, I mean, then we're sort of back in, in the 14th century when you have to compare it to Christianity. Yeah, absolutely. And I know something that a lot of people look at statistics, they'll look at Pew surveys, uh, either globally or in America or in Canada, and they'll say, well, it looks like the nuns are growing. It looks like people who people are leaving religious belief. The problem is the people who are the fundamentalist religious people are breeding like rabbits. <laughs> and so it's, even though the, I, the bad ideas are going away, the, the, the believers are making so many duplicates of themselves, it's hard to keep up. <laughs> and so... And so globally, even though, um, you know, we may be winning in the, in the public conversation, you know, globally it's looking like that the secular position is actually going to go back down a little in, in 10 to 15 years. And so I think I want to move the, the conversation for a moment to inspiring children to think critically, inspiring children to be science-based. Is it, is it too early to start in kindergarten or first grade, you know? How do we, I guess I'll pose this as the question, how can we inspire young people, very, very small children, to, to start thinking critically as early as possible? Well, I would flip it. It's not that you, the question isn't, isn't is it too early to start? It's, it's, it's the things you don't start. If you, if you don't start lying to your children or pretending to know things you don't know, then this problem never starts in the first place. That's a great point, yeah. That's great. Uh, now, I've actually, I did that with m my own kids when it came to certain beliefs, like Santa or the Easter Bunny. Mm -hmm. And then some will say, oh, but you're robbing them of that mystical feeling of, of um, magic land. You know, what do you say to that? Like, oh, let, let me have yeah. that for my kid to teach them that stuff. Strangely, that was the most common question I got when I wrote, I wrote this short book, Lying, where I, I argue uh, very stridently that you should more or less never lie, that you should, you should think about lying as, as the least violent thing you can do in self-defense. So you should put on the continuum of violence, uh, but in normal relationships where you are dealing with someone who's rational, who, who is conceivably on your team, who's not trying to harm you overtly, well then I, I think lying is... is is more or less always unethical, even so-called white lies. And but this, so I got a lot of pushback against this. But the most common, by a factor of ten, was what about Santa? What about Santa? <laughs> and, Surely that's the one lie we can still yeah. get away with, right, Sam? <laughs> uh, and I also, strangely, I also heard from many people who remembered what it was like to realize that their parents had been lying to them about Santa, and, and re they remember the harm it did to their view of their parents. Uh, they actually, they had this, they're carrying around this wound. Uh, but, I mean, 
as far as Santa's concerned, it's like, this, it's this one thing <laughs> that, I mean, it's, it's already the best holiday, right? It's already the most fun. You get presents. Uh, we, we have no temptation to lie about other things that are fictional and fun. I mean, you don't have to tell kids that Harry Potter really exists to get them into the Harry Potter story or, the, you know, the Lord of the Rings. Or, and Halloween is fun. You don't have to say there really are witches and ghosts. And it's just that you, you don't have to, to juice a, a, a child's capacity for, for finding fiction fun. Uh, but that, I mean, the, the deeper issue with lying is... I mean, I, honestly, I, I have only once found myself lying to my oldest daughter. She's now she's about to turn nine. And it was totally inadvertent. I, we, were, we, I, we did a Google search of something. She was about five or six. And so the images are coming up. And uh, you know, you're all, uh, if you're a parent, you know what this is like. You don't know what the hell is going to come up. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, so my... Uh, this is uh, a digression, but my daughter just asked, she, so she, she has to ask permission for, for Google searches, because uh, she's looking, she got, she got really into iMovie, and she needs to find you know, still photos for her, her movies. Uh, and so she said, uh, can I do a, uh, a Google search for schoolgirl? <laughs> and it took me about five seconds to realize how bad that was gonna go. <laughs> So anyway, we, we did this Google search, and an image of what was like, like a 14th century woodcut image of a witch being killed by the Inquisition, and in this case, having his or her head cut off, uh, came up. But it was you know, this, you know, as, as benign a version of that as possible. It was just you know, this, this old woodcut. And I'm scrolling past it, and she stops me. She says, what was that? And I just, I just didn't have enough time to tell the, my version of the truth here, so I wound up saying uh, that was a very old and impractical form of surgery. Uh, but uh, honestly, that is the one lie I've told my daughter. I've never found it necessary to, to lie to her. And so everything that I would want to impart is, as far as critical thinking or you know, skepticism with respect to specific ideas, all of that's just coming in, you know, by osmosis. I mean, she just gets all of it. I mean, she has the tools now, and she's not even nine. Yeah, my mother regretted, even as a Christian, telling me about Santa, because when I did find out the truth, I was probably eight or nine, as soon as she told me, I immediately went, oh, so Jesus is fake too. <laughs> I, she I, was I've horrified. Heard, I've heard from many people who've had that she experience. Was, yeah, she was horrified. And so I've always thought, you know, you... you you lie to your kids about the Easter Bunny, you lie to your kids about Santa Claus, you lie to your kids about the Tooth Fairy, and then you're shocked when they're 13 and they start lying to you. <laughs> like, where do you think they're getting this from? You know? So I, I don't, I mean, I, I want to instill, we, what we've done in, in my home, and my kids are much older now, but what we've done in my home is just encouraged, pretend, but we call it pretend. Right. I mean, to this day, my kids are 13 and 17, and I'll still write from Santa on the package, and I'll never admit to buying it, but of course, they know better. The same with the Tooth Fairy. We intentionally tell them it's pretend, but we continue to pretend, and I think that's a way to sort of, like you yeah. were saying, inspire that awe and wonder in the mystical realm, but understand it is what it is. You know, so how can we then take that, allow them to have that pretend time, but encourage and inspire the science? I mean, obviously, we're not going to teach evolution to kindergartners. There's got to be a, a barrier. Do you have any, any ideas or thoughts on, on how we can inspire very, very young kids? Well, I, again, I think it's just a, a commitment to giving every appropriate and fascinating truth whenever it's relevant, you know, so that you have to calibrate what you say to, to you know, to a three-year-old or a four-year-old or a seven-year-old, but there's some appropriate version of the truth that is potentially fascinating. It's not, and I'm not under any illusions that every kid will be equally interested in science. You know, it's, uh, it, it's just not, and heavy-handed attempts to make them more interested than they are you know, natively in any given moment, just at least if you're their father, doesn't work very well. Uh, so I, you just have to make it, you have to represent your interests honestly and uh, again, it's just, if you're never tempted to lie, 
uh, or if you are tempted, you, if, you, if you become skeptical of that uh, motivation, um, it all just, it, it, it just keeps finding its way into the conversation. And then, you're, then you're, you're dealing with a child who, again, at a very young age, is still uh, is running some version of a, a reality check that is, is fairly adult, in which many adults never uh, manage to get online. You know, it's like there's, just, there's, there's a kind of, um, there's, a, there's a pause before believing certain things uh, and uh, just kind of a, just a, a, a checking operation that uh, is, uh, it's very surprising to me to see it in, so, in somebody so young, but it's just, it's, I mean, that is the basis of science. We're all so interested in having our opinions heard and sort of being an outward flow of information that when a child asks a question, we so badly want to just say, here's the answer or, or this is what I think is the case. And I think a great response that I've heard from a lot of people is they just say to the child, what do you think? Mm -hmm. Even some very liberal Christians who will talk to me and say, I appreciate the conversations you have, I appreciate your respectful approach, but I think you're wrong. I'll ask them, what do you say to your kid when they say, was Jesus born of a virgin or does God exist? Some of them are starting to tell me, they're saying, I don't know, what do you think? And they're letting the kid explore these ideas. And, and to your point, what I did with my daughter is, I, I would teach her about Jesus as a kid, but we would also teach her about Thor and Demeter and, and Zeus. And she sort of learned about religion in this overall concept of different religions. And, and you know, we, we left out, of course, the beheadings, yeah. and that, that impractical form of surgery you talked about. You know, but, but we did sort of explain religion in that concept. And, and the first part of what you said is also relevant. To be able to say, I don't know, I mean, uh, grown-ups are very uncomfortable saying that to their kids, it seems. And you think they, they don't want to appear weak in front of their kids? They want to appear as this... I mean, look, they're going to find out eventually that you're, that you're not perfect. And so I think being able to say, I don't know, is... Uh, yeah, but you can just flip it. I, mean, I don't know is the doorway to everything that's worth finding out. I mean, it, it, is, the, it is the basis of curiosity. And, and my, my wife, Annika, wrote a children's book about this entitled I Wonder. I mean, it, was, it was motivated directly by this experience of just seeing our daughter pretend to know things that she obviously didn't know. And we realized that we had never taught her that it was okay to say I don't know. Like, there was nothing embarrassing about not knowing. And um, then the pendulum swung the other way and she would say I don't know to every <laughs> question. It was like she was a, you know, one of our hostages in Vietnam, you know, just giving <laughs> name, rank, and serial number and, and answering nothing. But, uh, uh, but now we're, we're, we're back in, in some sane place. I can imagine your kids. That would be so much fun. For, is your room clean? Well, what is clean, Dad? <laughs> is anything ever really clean? <laughs> headed there, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. So, so speaking of children, We've heard these horrific stories of, um, you know, a child being sick or um, in some way in need of medical care and fundamentalist parents laying hands on the child or praying for the child and, and neglecting the medical treatment. And a lot of times, at least in the States, what happens is the government will say there's nothing we can do at the time because, uh, well, that's your religious freedom. But once the child dies, then they can say, okay, well, you neglected them from medical treatment or something else. They won't kick in the door and take the child for medical care, even if it's a preventable or curable disease or sickness. But they will, after the fact, say, okay, well, you neglected to provide that child with medical treatment. And so, obviously, there's this blurred line between religious freedoms and protecting someone from religious hurt and harm. So we all probably have different lines. I want to start with you, Sarah. Where do you draw that line between people having the freedom to express their own religion and practice their own religion and then preventing a child from being harmed? Even something small like, for example, Amish will often take their children out of school at like second grade and say, that's enough learning for you. Get on the farm and start working. There's different levels of harm. Where do you draw that line? Well, it's, it's easy to make the distinction in some cases. Um, like if you were to look at the female genital mutilation cases that are coming out of uh, Michigan, 
and they're finding that there have been girls, um, 100 girls or so, that have been cut um, in, you know, in Michigan, in the United States. Um, and they're prosecuting, they're going through and they're, they're trying to prosecute the, doc the doctors who performed the operations. And I think in those cases, it's an easy, it's an easy call to make. It's easy to say that, well, this is a child is a human being and they have the right to their bodily integrity. And very clearly, their bodily integrity uh, has been, you know, it has been just uh, harmed or at least, or even destroyed in some, in some cases, uh, depending on how bad the actual, um, you know, the actual cut was. So I think it's easy to make the case in something like that. It's harder uh, when you look at something like the hijab, which I find to be quite harmful. I find it to be uh, some, something that really um, just instills this sense of, of shame in a, in a young woman about her body and about her sexuality. So it's very easy for me to, to argue that this is harmful too, but it, I'm uncomfortable with saying that parents should not be allowed to um, request or even, you know, push their, their children to wearing a hijab. Let me ask you there when you, about the hijab. Aren't there some women who find sort of a, a sense of pride in wearing it so that if you were to try to say, you know, I find that harmful, I'm going to fight for you not to have to wear this, would you get some pushback from women within Islam that'll say, excuse me, I find this as a rite of passage or this is a, this is a symbol of my my connection to God or something along those lines where they don't want to be protected from that and they find it offensive that you find the hijab offensive. Well, I mean, anytime you talk about banning anything, you run the risk of turning it into, from a, from a religious symbol to a political symbol. And then it becomes uh, almost more powerful. In a, in a lot of ways, it does become more powerful because people who might not be religious to begin with uh, might wear the hijab out of solidarity because they feel like this is, uh, that their, their Muslim brothers and sisters are, are, their civil liberties are being infringed upon. So they will do it out of this sense of solidarity. And that's terrible because what it does is it, it, you know, covers up the actual harm that's taking place and the religious justification which we need to talk about and we need to discuss and we need to, to understand why it's so harmful and why. Do you think it's abusive for a, a, a parent to have their child wear a hijab? Is it? It's interesting because I can I can definitely say it's harmful, but whether abuse is different because to to some extent it it has this connotation where the parent is trying to harm the child in some way. Uh, and I don't know if that's, if that's the case. And in fact, many Muslim parents, I mean, this, they think that they're protecting their girls. They think they're doing what's best for them. They think they're going to set them up for life once they've um, you know, taught them the values of modesty. So is it, is it abuse in, from, from that perspective? I don't, I don't know, but it definitely does have a harm. Well, it's also confused by the fact that, that in many cases they're they're right about how their daughters will be treated in the community mm -hmm. by Muslim boys and men uh, if they don't wear the hijab. So it's, they are they are protecting them from abuse in in that, in that particular context. context. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that, that's absolutely true. That it is a it's a, ra it's a it's a rational decision to protect your child not just from the hereafter and, and what God is going to do there, but the way that they're going to be treated in in this life uh, here and now. Um, so, you know, from that perspective, you can even you can even look at many Muslim many Muslim homes. A lot of ex-Muslims that I talk to, women especially, the ones that were forced into hijab, and they'll talk about how it was their mothers um, who forced them to to wear the hijab, who enforced these sort of codes on them, these modesty codes on them, who made them feel ashamed about their sexual urges. Um, but if you look at it from the pers perspective of the mother, the mother is trying to protect somebody who she cares about very much. Uh, and she wants to make sure that, uh, that, that her daughter has every option open to her, you know, within that society. So it's, 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 a, it's a tricky thing. Yeah, I've, I've heard a similar argument, of course, that's much less harmful, but I've heard a similar argument from fundamentalist parents who would want to lay hands on a child who is sick when you challenge them with why not give them medication and pray, why not do both, they would actually say that's an affront to God's power. That's a slap in the face to God. How dare you think he's going to be limited or somehow not going to perform this miracle? And they would do the same way. We're doing it so that, our, so that God knows how much we love him. And at that point, obviously, we would say that's where the line is. There's a clear line there. What are your, what are your it's thoughts? always strange that they never do that with amputations. <laughs> I mean, this is the... the the website you probably still exists. Well, why does God hate amputees? No one has ever successfully prayed for the regrowth of an arm or a leg. 
and you and no one everyone prays for or is, or is tempted to pray for conditions that on their face seem liable to be self-limiting whereas something like a, you know a lost limb clearly isn't but if god had that power you would you would be tempted to pray even there you know, so. the, the the interesting thing is we run the risk of i guess advocating for legislation that would then go into people's homes and tell them how to raise their children, which most secular people are like, hey, let people do what they want to do in their homes. And, you know, but when you start bringing these types of topics up, I would advocate that that, 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 that should be illegal, you know, and that you shouldn't be able to do that. Well, well now am I, am I religion, being... If you, well, if you take the, the, the sanctity of religion out of it and you just talk about it in terms of belief, right, and then you think of... of I mean, it's, it's, just, it's clear, I mean, the, sta the state clearly has an interest, and we all have an interest in not letting our neighbors destroy their children. Because, I mean, they, obviously, we, can't, we, we shouldn't let our neighbors kill their children, and we shouldn't let our neighbors so harm their children that they become adults that we find it very difficult to live with. So there's some, there's some area there where the state and we all have an interest in intruding into the lives of parents who are, who are parenting badly, and it doesn't matter if their motives are religious, right? So like that, that the, the, the crucial taboo to, to get past, especially in the States, is this idea that, well, if it was a religious motivation for not giving medicine, you know, or not, uh, you know, I mean, the, 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 these extreme cases. Like the blood, kid, blood transfusion. Yeah, or the kid transfusion. is found out to be diabetic, right, and they won't give insulin, right, and the kid dies. Uh, that's just straight up child abuse. Right, so, and so that, that the fact that there was religion in the mix shouldn't confuse anybody, and it, it still reliably confuses our courts, and that's that's the problem. Well, when it comes to Islam, I think the fact that religion is part of the mix uh, confuses things in another way, in that people don't feel comfortable about bringing it up. They don't feel comfortable saying that you know FGM or 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 honor violence is more common within Islam and people yeah. who practice Islam than it is anywhere else. And so that, that creates this just impossible challenge for people who are trying to address these harms and see what they can do to, what preventative action they can take. So say you can maybe train teachers and counselors or, or what have you to, to recognize signs of somebody who might be at risk for a forced marriage, for example. But in order to do that, you have to recognize that certain people are more at risk than others, and those certain people come from uh, certain kinds of ethnic backgrounds or certain kinds of religious backgrounds. And those are things that people are very uncomfortable doing. They're, they're uncomfortable with even touching that issue and talking about it and saying that this particular harm may be unique to this community, particularly if that community is a minority of any kind, um, especially with Islam. So that, that adds a, a, another layer of challenges to this. Yeah, and when, I think it comes down, too, to being unable to effectively define harm. Because you could say, oh, you know, anything that harms a child, you know, your belief shouldn't be that important. But then again, you know, and, and as we're advocating for some sort of legislation to keep children safe from religious harm, we can use that word. They can say, look, what we're doing is actually protecting our child from hell or from whatever. And so they could advocate that they're, you know, it's like, a, you know, you get a shot at the dentist. It hurts a little bit now, but it, it's, it's good for the overall. They make that argument that it's bad for the child now, but it'll be better when they're gone or when they're in heaven. And so then you get to this sort of fight of we're doing what's best for the children. No, we're doing what's best for the children. And then we have to advocate for legislation that would then go into someone's home and say, you know, if your child is sick, you must do something with the doctor. Otherwise, it's, it's neglect and abuse. Mm. It can yeah. be kind of a scary yeah. situation, I think. I, I, don't, I don't want us to come off as hypocrites by saying... Let's, let's you know, advocate for this legislation that's going to tell you how to raise your children when that's what we've been against this whole time is let me raise my kids the way I want. Don't force me to take my kid to a school that's going to teach them about religion. Well, the school is also a, a, an important part of it. If, if the schools were sufficiently intrusive in what they taught, then you can, you can outsource a lot of that uh, to the state in that sense. I mean, if, if, for instance, evolution. If the schools just taught evolution, and there was no scope for religious parents on the school board to say, well, no, actually, we should be teaching the controversy. Um, then the kids, despite what the parents believe about the Bible and God and, and the origin of, of humanity, 
the schools would be teaching evolution and the, the religious parents would just have to deal with it, right? So I, I think that the state could intrude in the, without ever having to you know, kick in the door and, and uh, change what's happening in the home. It just, it could, and the same with the hijab. If, if schools wouldn't let you wear a hijab, you know, then it, would, it wouldn't be on the parents or on anyone else to make that decision. There would just be, you know, there's no hijab in school, so that's... Uh, that seems like not a good idea. Why? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, in, the, in the case of Muslim girls, uh, you're, you're talking about a population who, well, first of all, what would be the parents' reaction to hearing that uh, their child, uh, when they have to go to school, they have to take off the hijab. For some, it might be, okay, we'll, we'll have them take off the hijab. For others, it's, we're putting you into a religious school yeah. where this is going to be allowed. Or we're taking you back home where you, know, you don't have to worry about that at all and you can be covered. So this, this idea that we will necessarily protect the most, most vulnerable Muslim women, I, I, I don't think that's necessarily the case. There have been similar conversations about um, banning the hijab in certain, uh, certain kinds of public official jobs, you know, it, where, where you're working in a, in a government office, for example, that there shouldn't be a display of, of religious affiliation in that sort of a visible way. Usually these conversations happen with Europeans, <laughs> French uh, in particular, but I, I think that can be harmful as well because then you're taking away just that another employment opportunity from a woman who, who might need it, you know, for whom this might be uh, another tool for her to be a little bit more empowered than she would be otherwise. I can't see how that would ultimately help the women that, that we want to, that we want to, you know, do something for. Mm. Yeah, well, I definitely agree that the French approach is not, is too heavy handed. I mean, I think the banning, the, the banning the burqa is, um, I mean, in certain contexts, I think you, you would need to ban it, but uh, in general, I think it's, I worry about the same thing, just isolating people, the most vulnerable people in the Muslim community, because there's, you know, okay, if, if um, you know, they, their parents won't let them see doctors, they won't let them go to, to school, and you don't know what's, you, the, 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 you don't have enough information to actually know what's happening behind closed doors, so, yeah. Let's shift to a lighter topic, something that's a little more fun, white supremacy. Let's, <laughs> let's touch on this one a little. Uh, we might not be here long, I just find it silly anytime I see someone who's a white supremacist, whether they're wearing the hood in the KKK or they're marching and chanting how great and pure and perfect they are. And I just, I just kind of giggle at them sometimes and go, you have no idea how much West African, North African, Neanderthal is running through your DNA. Mm. And the rest of us are just kind of off to the side going, what are you proud of exactly? Like, what are you... What's so great about it? So I wanted to open the discussion briefly about just, you know, obviously it comes from ignorance, but where do you think this idea, other than the missing the facts, uh, of white supremacy comes from? Where, where are these guys getting this information that they're special? Well, uh, I, I can't answer that, but uh, <laughs> I mean, it's interesting. The genetic evidence cut, the right, for our purposes, is cut the right way in the last few years. I think it was about five years ago where they, where they did a, the, the genome, the Neanderthal genome, and it was found that the only people on Earth who are 100% homo sapiens are Africans, you know, right. sub-Saharan Africa. <laughs> Everyone else was, you know, their, your grandma was raped by Neanderthals or raped a Neanderthal. Uh, <laughs> so, your, uh, your not, part Not often the word rape gets a laugh twice in a row. I just want to say <laughs> it's very, very well placed there, Sam. So that was really delightful, but it, <laughs> it's, it's useful to point out, though, that it could have been the other way, right? And, and that, would be a, then that would be a taboo thing to be pointing out right. uh, you know, in terms of political correctness, but yeah, that was fantastic. But I, I, I have an opening invitation uh, for any white supremacist who wants to come on Dogma Debate. We will pay for a DNA test to prove your purity, and we'll see how it works out. Uh, I, I would, I would yeah. love to do that, but I, I mean, this, the, the I mean, it's just, it's got to be the way they're raised, right? It's got to be that you're very, very special, you're perfect, see, your beautiful white skin, it's all perfect, and they just grow up with all this ignorance of the, of the data, right? Well, yeah, clearly it is what you teach kids. I mean, everyone who's a parent in this room just needs to think for a moment of what it's like to be in the presence of a child 
who knows nothing, right? And you're just, you, you're, you're in this position of filling their head with a worldview. And if you're a rational parent who has the interest of your child at heart, well, then you're just telling them, you know, appropriate facts as, as you, you know, as, as more or less as fast as you can. Uh, but it just, and again, I'm speaking to someone who did not have a, a childhood of religious indoctrination, but I can only imagine what it was like to hear from your parents, the, the, you know, the, the most authoritative authorities that, that exist for the longest period of time, from the moment you could understand human speech to be hearing about hell and about the fact that you would go there if, if um, you know, you didn't believe in Jesus or you, you didn't believe that the, the Quran was the perfect word. And... I mean, I still hear, I hear from atheists who can't yet shake the fear of hell. I mean, they've been atheists for 20 years, but there's still part of them that was sufficiently indoctrinated with this that um, they, again, I don't, even, I don't even know how they process this as a conscious thought, but they are, part of them is still worried that they might wind up in hellfire. So this idea of, of being special or being better than other people it's, 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 an, it's another it's, ideology that you can just impart to a kid, and there's, it, there's no mystery as to why they would believe it when they're, they turn 10, if that's what you have been telling them for 10 years. Again, facts, I guess, are going to be the best ammunition against that, just you know, continuing to teach about. And, and I've seen a guy, there's some show where um, a guy went on and did a, a white, I mean, a, he's a white supremacist, and he went on and did a DNA test. And when they showed him the results, he was like 14% West African or something. He's much higher percentage than many other many other whites, and um, he just denied the results. <laughs> he was just like, yeah, yeah. Well, that, I mean, there, well, there wonder who Nazis. put that out there. There, yeah. there, were, there were Nazis in, in Germany and during the war who at a certain point found out that they were Jewish. You know, that's, it's, you know, that's a rather gorgeous revelation. Uh, but it, you're always vulnerable. If you think and this, this, this is, comes down to what's wrong with identity politics, really. If, if you think that the goodness of a certain principle, you know, if you, if you, if you want to organize society with respect to things like justice and fairness, uh, and the, the lens through which you are judging the rightness of any principle is your identity with a certain tribe, right? That's... It, 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 at a minimum, you're just you're vulnerable to discovering that you're actually not in that tribe, right? Which is, you know, but but the the problem with identity politics is that you're whatever you think is true or good has to be something you could persuade others of, and the only way you could persuade them is because they are others is to to make an argument that that doesn't depend on who you are, right? It's not, it's not a, uh, I mean, that's what it is to, to reason with people, and that, that's what it is to actually have reasons for what you believe, and, and this is what was so brilliant about the political philosopher John Rawls's thought experiment. I, I'm sure many of you have heard of Rawls, if not read his books, but he's, he talked about a conception of a just society being something we could all converge on if we reasoned from what he called the original position or, or from behind a veil of ignorance. And, and so this veil of ignorance is we have all of the facts of science and reality to, to work with, uh, but we just don't know anything about who we are in this society. You don't know if you're black or white or man or woman or tall or short or whether you have brain damage. I mean, you have no idea what, how lucky you are or unlucky you are. And so from behind that veil of ignorance, the burden is on you to come up with principles of fairness and justice, uh, which, you, which you would agree to before you find out who you are in this society, before you find out that you're rich or you're poor. Uh, and to be reasoning in any other way, which is the, the core of identity politics, is to not do that and to reason from the point of view of, well, listen, as a white man or as a black woman, I believe X, right? But that's, that, that's exactly what you, that's exactly what it is to be biased. That's, that's exactly what it is to have your 
principles uh, undermined by self-interest. And that's, I mean, it's clearly that the way forward is to be doing something much more like Rawls suggested. I'm, I'm being signaled that it's time to take questions, but Sarah, I wanted to make sure you didn't have anything you wanted to get in on that, especially it being white supremacy. I don't want to get some accusation. Oh, you didn't let Sarah ask, you know, get in on the conversation about white supremacy. I, I, I want to make sure there's nothing you had to add to that. Before. Well, I, I, not much in that I agree that it's just another form of, uh, it's just another form of a group of people finding a way to feel like they're superior to everyone else, that they have a, 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 a clearer view on the world and they're able to see things as they are and they're able to manipulate the world uh, better than anyone else. I mean, we've seen this in a variety of different political ideologies and then we see that, that in, in religion and it makes sense to me that for some people race would be a good vehicle. But I will say that I don't really like the idea of using DNA tests as you know a gotcha kind of thing for oh, nice. Well, because, you know, it, 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 it's, okay, it's viscerally fun to just hurt these people in some way, right? Like, it's, 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 it's just, just like, oh, ha-ha, right? But at the same time, you're, you're not doing anything about the hatred itself. You're just using that hatred as a tool to just hurt somebody. Um, you know, like, ha-ha, you think black people are scum, but you're one-fourth black, so you're scum, according to you, right? I mean, there's something a little bit dirty about, like, playing that game and, and you know, perhaps... Perhaps that's not the way we should be going about it because the ultimate idea is that even if it were 100% white, I mean, it would still be a terrible way to think about the world. Yeah, I'm glad you said that, uh, and I'm glad to know you think about me that way. By the <laughs> way. Thank you for that. No, um, that's a great point, and I never considered it like a hateful thing, so I'm glad you brought that up. I never considered it to be like a thumbing at the nose, ha-ha, you're part of this. It was really, my idea was more of a bringing people together to say, you're, you're proud of what? You, you think you have this pure white whatever. There's no such thing as that. Um, you're connected to everyone that you're being hateful toward, and hopefully that would help them bring their walls down and say, wait a minute, my, my hatefulness is based in ignorance. I'm, I'm proud of something that really doesn't even exist. Uh, I'm, I'm, we're, we're all connected. We all have common ancestors. That was really my angle. Yeah, yeah. I, I would never I, leave and for, I understand you know, that. Like, to take that there's... Into hateful there's some way that you can use their, their self-image and their desire to find themselves as superior um, you know, against them in that way, and maybe that will lead them to think that you know, black people aren't so bad or Asian people aren't so bad if they find out that they themselves are mixed. Uh, but I don't think that, that will nece it necessarily turns out to be that way. I mean, um, like you've said and, and Sam said, a lot of people deny the, 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 the test results. And even then, you don't, you know, you don't, know, you don't actually know if they, what it'll lead to is for them to reevaluate um, how, how they see supremacy. Maybe not white supremacy, but just supremacy uh, based on racial characteristics. They might just you know, reevaluate uh, what percent white is acceptable in order to be you know, superior yeah, or perhaps mixed people are more are, are, are superior. So it doesn't really tackle the underlying ideology which is so hateful and, and repulsive. That's a great point. Thank you. So I did have a few more topics I wanted to get to, but it is time for the Q&A. So if you would, go ahead and line up at the mics. Can they uh, get some lights to be able to see? There you go. So it looks like this microphone right here is, is labeled number one, and this is number two, so I'll know that when I call it out. Yeah, but I wanted to. Uh, all right, guys. Um, so we're going to need to keep the talking down so we can hear the first question. If you would, please. Thank you. I got you. Go ahead. Uh, just wondering if space exploration to any extent might be, might be able to take the myths out of the heavens. Um, if we're traveling to other planets, eventually in other solar systems, is it going to be that much fun to pray toward Mecca? Is it going to change the way we think about life after death once brains are transplanted? Is there a chance radical innovation will help dissolve our attachments to religion? 
Will that help put the knife yeah. in it, ultimately? I mean, you, you've got to think every little bit helps, but religious belief has been impressively resistant to, I mean, to take that rather clear point. I mean, this, it, we, every, when you read the Bible, there's, it's fairly obvious that they had no idea what was going on up there. And they thought heaven was very likely up there as a place that Jesus could ascend to. They thought shooting stars were in fact stars that were falling out of the sky. Uh, so the disconfirmation of all of that and, and, and the sense of you know where, where could Jesus have ascended to? I mean, it just gets colder and colder and colder and then, then, you know, then there's no oxygen at all and no place to really wait around for 2,000 years up there. Uh, but none of that seems to cut very deep for the fundamentalists. They have some other way of, of not caring about that. And I think to add to that, a lot of the argument is that this idea of God in heaven is outside of time and space. So the ones that are hardcore fundamental will probably stay there uh, in the face of that. But like you said, every little bit helps. You never know. Hi. Hi. Mr. Harris, I'm wondering if you could compare and contrast the uh, anti-fascist movement that took place in Britain after World War II mm. to try to stamp out Nazism with this new Antifa movement in the U.S. and what place it has. Well, I, I have to plead historical ignorance about the, the details of what the anti-fascists were up to during World War II in, in the U.K. I, mean, I guess there was, obviously there was a very good reason to be anti-fascist at that point. And if you could have resisted fascism, it, I, I, you, one would have wanted you to do it in more or less any way you, you could. And then at a certain point, it was a very good reason to go to war against Germany. Uh, and I, I, I don't think many of us are wondering whether we were on the right side of that war. Uh, so there is a right side and a wrong side in, in some of these cases, certainly. And uh, but in the case of, of what the so-called anti-fascists, you know, Antifa is doing in the U.S. now, I mean, these people just seem like unprincipled goons to me. I mean, this is not, it's not a political movement. And it, it is a, it's a painful irony that the, the people who are reliably closing down free speech on college campuses now in the U.S. are on the left. It's not right-wing people, it's not neo-Nazis, it's not the people who marched in Charlottesville. These are people on the left who are making it unsafe for people to speak on college campuses now. And that's just, it's, uh, it's something we shouldn't have any patience for, you know. So I'm, I'm uh, more and more in my regular life out in the world talking with folks that uh, have religious belief, I'm finding what I've come to think of as the lazy theist, where I think people in this room would agree with me that in order to get to an atheistic <coughs> worldview, you've got to do some work to get there. And I know a lot of, I'm finding a lot of people are uh, defaulting into the theist position that I'm talking to. Mm. And they're not doing a lot of work, they're just happy to be com complacent and kind of be a sheep in their regular life and follow on with this religious viewpoint. And uh, then I'll get into a conversation with them and I'll bring up something like, uh, you know, the Ark in the Middle East, no marsupials anywhere but Australia. And they'll say, oh, I've never thought of that. I, I've just never, that never occurred to me to think about that. So they're not doing any work. This is that kind of lazy theist and they just default into it. And I think those people are up for grabs for us. And I'm just mm -hmm. curious, uh, <laughs> if you guys have, have run into this in, in your life and in your conversations, and, uh, and if you have, if you have a strategy for how we might um, pick this low-hanging fruit and bring them over to the side of rationality and reason. Well, it's, it's, uh, that's what we've been up to for, for a while. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I would point out they're lazy in, on both sides. They're, they're also lazy theologians, you know, they're not, it's not, most of these people are not spending a lot of time understanding their scriptures either. I mean, they obviously, fundamentalists 
uh, and ultra orthodox people don't don't have that particular sin. But there there are people who are. I mean, the, the the poll results on Americans' knowledge of what's actually in the Bible are just astonishing. I mean, they don't know if half of America doesn't know who delivered the Sermon on the Mount. It's just so it, 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 these are not informed theists for the most part, but they have a a sense that has been imparted to them with the you know, details held aside that you can't be a good person, and you certainly can't be thought to be a good person by your community if you don't endorse religion on some level, no matter how little work that endorsement does in your day-to-day -day life. There's a sense that the, the bottom drops out in your moral worldview. Uh, if you don't at least pay lip service to religion. And that, that's something that we just have to keep proving to be false. I would say, too, being able to ask questions, implore the Socratic method, some basic tenets of street epistemology. We don't have to go out preaching. You can ask enough questions for someone to realize they don't have the answers they thought they did. And I don't think anyone in here, if you were ever religious, um, was deconverted because you were called an asshole by somebody online, right? None of us did that. We deconverted ourselves by doing research and doing honest inquiry into our views. And so asking someone tends to plant those seeds and sparks that, 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 um, that idea that maybe what I believe isn't 100% accurate. Getting them to think, start thinking that way, I think, is very, very effective. Uh, big fan um, of everybody up there. I just, I have a question I don't think I've ever heard answered before. You've addressed the idea that uh, Muslim women are often marginalized and there's issues of uh, female genital mutilation and, uh, you know, honor killings and all of these horrible things. But I've never really heard any sympathy for whatever role uh, young Muslim men are, are in uh, and what kind of life they're kind of forced or, or expected to be in, in that same kind of way. Um, do you have any kind of input on how you feel that like they're marginalized in their own lives? Um, and if I could get that from Sarah first, because I think you might have an interesting outlook, but I'd also like to hear from you. Well, sure, yeah. I mean, I agree with you that it, it isn't something we talk about too often, um, but on the other hand, it does make sense, uh, given the nature of Muslim society and the relative freedoms that are accord afforded to Muslim men, for example, they can marry, you know, they can marry outside and they can, mar they can marry a Christian woman if they want to, they have that, that level of freedom and, and a woman doesn't really have that kind of freedom. In another way, in another sense, um, women don't really have the, the right to divorce, you know, in, in, in a traditional sense uh, of Islam, what they can do is they can request it uh, from the husband and he can deny the request. Uh, and then you can go to, you know, you can go to a, like a mullah and then they can, or a religious leader, and they can accept the request or deny it. And if they deny it, you're sort of just, you know, stuck in kind of a bad situation. So uh, I, you know, I understand why women's rights get kind of the spotlight when we're talking about Islam and it does make sense. But you are, um, you are correct in thinking that there, there are ways in which it really poisons and and harms men and in ways that are specific to men. So the first there's the just general religious harm that, that, that affects both men and women, just this way of thinking about the world that um, harms both men and women. But um, there is this idea that, that a man has to be a provider um, and he has, to, you know, he has to prove himself in certain ways and that can be quite difficult, quite damaging. Um, it, to, to their psyche, to their stress levels, and it makes it difficult for them sometimes to perform that role, and if they can't make it into that role, then it says something about them as a man. So there are, you know, sort of poisonous aspects to it uh, that affect both genders. Yeah, uh, well, I think that, that covers it. I, I, there's a reason, it's, it's, it's not a surprise that we don't spend a lot of time worrying about how Muslim men are harmed by the view of women in Muslim, in traditional Muslim societies, but they clearly are harmed. I mean, they're not, they're not given an opportunity to develop what we would consider psychologically normal relationships with women as teenagers, say. I mean, crucial years where you're, you're either surrounded by strong women who you respect as equals, or you are taught something 
absolutely antithetical to that experience, which is that there are these, you're taught to fear them, and you're like given this Madonna horror complex, uh, and it's enshrined as, as just you know, God's view of the situation, and it's a, it's a very uh, dysfunctional way to, to view women, and, and we, we see the consequences of it, and clearly it's harming men, but it's, it's, it's easy to see that it's, we should focus on the women first, because they're the ones who, who in turn are, are being actively harmed by, by the men in their lives. But as, as Sarah pointed out, it's also the women who believe this doctrine, too, who are enforcing it. I mean, take, the men can't do this by themselves. In, in all of these religious cultures, the women, you know, the, this is not just a problem under Islam. If you, if you hear about, you know, dowry deaths in the, in the Hindu community in India, right? There, there, there are women who are throwing acid on the, on the faces of, of uh, the, the, the new bride who, who's, you know, who they want to get rid of. You know, I mean, it's just, it's, it's absolutely bizarre. And it's, you know, both, both sexes are part of the problem. Hi. It, it seems to be extremely common these days for people to form opinions or, or make decisions based on emotion or instinct and then only invoke the reasoning afterwards to try and justify that initial mm. emotion. I'm wondering if, if you have any thoughts on strategies that can be reliable to try to uh, deal with that confirmation bias or, or things that people can actually use in their day-to-day -day life to avoid that trap? Yeah, I think there, well, it's good to just know that that is something you and everyone else does at, at a minimum from time to time, if not most of the time. This is something that the psychologist Jonathan Haidt has argued for a lot, that we do this, especially on moral questions. We, we have this, this gut reaction of disgust, say, and then we, then all of the, the so-called moral reasoning that comes online afterwards to justify our disgust is just doing that. It's just we're reasoning like lawyers, making the case for what we already feel. We're not arriving at this position first by, by a, a process of reasoning. But I, I think it's useful to ask yourself on any topic, whenever you, when, whenever you find yourself taking your own opinion seriously, uh, well, one, you should, it's worth asking yourself whether it's, it's necessary to do that. I mean, why is it that you seem to have an opinion about everything? I mean, there's a, there's a lot out there that you don't know much about, and you could just sort of bracket your opinion for a moment and, and wonder how is it that you know this thing you seem to know, or how would you know if you were wrong? And if you, if you, can't, if you can't answer the question if you can't imagine a state of the world that would would demonstrate the wrongness of that opinion, well then then it's it's unfalsifiable, right? It's a strange opinion to have, uh, certainly to have strongly. Uh, so it's, I, it's 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 obviously it's easier to see in other people in the things they care about when you're just noticing them get caught and it's it's harder to see in yourself but it's it's good this is why it's good to be surrounded by smart people and to read good books and to watch good documentaries and to, to continually be in conversation with other points of view uh, and other people who are doing this debugging on their own worldviews uh, because then you can just keep catching yourself being being wrong Yeah, there are really two types of people, I think, that take advantage of that emotional decision-making process, and it's people who are selling you tangible products and people who are selling you bullshit. <laughs> and as long as we stay aware of it, usually we can maintain control over it. Um, so this is a, a plea in the form of a question, basically. I, I, want, I need you to, I need you, I was going to say I want you to tell me why I'm wrong with my, my worldview, but I need you to tell me why I'm wrong. And my son is here too, so even to say it in front of him, the weight of it all looks hopeless to me. The weight of ignorance, of delusion, you know, from the opening film that we saw to the discussion of what it would take for 1.6 people to change their minds about their rigorous belief, the lack of people even caring about the truth anymore in the States, what we're seeing going on, which we hoped was over, that kind of ignorance and 
even reveling in ignorance, feels completely hopeless. Mm -hmm. Tell me how I'm wrong and how there's still hope. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. No pressure. Well, <laughs> good night, good first, night. We're leaving. First, first, I have to figure out whether I really believe what I'm about to say, <laughs> uh, given my, my principle of not lying to you. Uh, well, it is, it's worth reflecting on how quickly things can change. And things can change, both for bad or for good. This cuts both ways. But things can change surprisingly quickly. And... Uh, this seems to be more and more true. I mean, when you, when you look at just, I don't know how in touch you are with this here in Canada, but in the States, the, our victory on gay marriage just happened in the blink of an eye. It's like there was a, there was a moment where it was, it was sort of made progress, and then it got rolled back, and then it sort of looked hopeless, and then all of a sudden it was accomplished. You know, and and it, 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 there are many things like that when you, when you look at you know, relevant scientific breakthroughs that change people's sense of, of, of what is good or possible or what religion should be doing. Uh, the, the sky's the limit there, really. I mean, we, we can make gains that never get rolled back or at least only get rolled back in some very fringe area where not even your, your average fundamentalist wants to go. So, I mean, the, the obvious case is... is you know, understanding epilepsy, and this is just the easiest example that I always go to, but there are very few, even Christian fundamentalists, who, when their child gets epilepsy, resort to just exorcism and don't go to a neurologist. I mean, if you, if you care about your child in the 21st century, you, you, you take your child to a doctor, and it's, it's, not, it's not the average fundamentalist who, who resists that. And uh, I just think, I think we shouldn't... I mean, part of it is, I mean, speaking to you personally and just, just how, how is it to sort of overcome this mood, you can spend less time focusing on the, the political trivia. I mean, I've actually stopped paying as much attention as I was paying to Trump because it just became psychologically toxic to me. And there was no, nothing to do with it. You know, it was like there was no, there was no, there was no benefit from it. And um, you can pay more attention. And, and you have to understand also that news is being selected for by just by it's just the, the the bad news is always rising to the top and there's always enough bad news given how you know globally connected we are now to fill every news broadcast with the seemingly the worst things that have ever happened to people every single night of the year I and mean, there's always going to be you know 10 murders that they could tell you about tonight somewhere uh, and so, and, and most news, most of the time, is just amplifying that signal, and you're not hearing about all of the great things that are happening, uh, and all of the all of the technological and moral and political improvements that are happening that are not being rolled back and are not likely to be rolled back. And uh, there's just there is no question that we're living in the luckiest time to be alive in human history. I mean, that is, that is, seems to be absolutely obvious. I mean, what, what other moment in history would you rather have been born? Uh, I, you know, there is, my list is, you know, there's, there is no, there's nothing on that list for me. Uh, and so that's, that is, uh, you, you have to do a little work, though, to, to, to keep that, salient, because what, what social media and the, and the media in general is going to tell you is that the world's on fire and, and you should get, just get ready to, to smell the smoke. Uh. If I may add to that, I, it's important to continue to remind ourselves that just because we're hearing about it doesn't mean that's the majority, right? We hear the, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Well, it, that's the case, but it doesn't mean all the wheels are squeaking, right? So when we hear these types of things happening, like, like Sam said, it's, it's, um, it's the, the news, it, it, you seeing it a lot only means the news media realizes what gets the attention and sells the advertisers. It doesn't necessarily mean that's the way the majority of people feel. 
uh, social media is not an accurate portrayal of reality. It's not real life. It's quick, hot sports opinions on the latest thing that's very uninformed. And if you look at that and think, wow, these are real human beings and this is the way they believe, it can get depressing. It really can. And the last thing that I'll, I'll leave you with on that is just that for me, anytime I see a void, I get inspired because I realize that's a place where I can make a difference. And right now, in the climate that we see, there's a lot of places for all of us to step up and make a difference. So whatever your, whatever your niche is, whatever it is, I almost said niche, see how I corrected that? Um, uh, whatever your niche is and, and whatever you enjoy doing, you can apply that in some way to make a positive difference. So you don't have to sit back and say the world's burning. You can actively help move it forward because there's plenty of room for you and all of us to step up. Well, I feel like you, you, both of you covered my thoughts pretty well. I, I can only add the more specific experience that I have as uh, an organizer of, you know, one of the most persecuted, you know, groups of people uh, ar around the world. Um, and I often think about the things that, that you just mentioned, and it's, it's hard not to think about uh, the likelihoods of it all, and I try in my own head not to play that game, uh, because it, it, for the, uh, on the, fr on the first um, point that they, they touched on, which is that we are ignorant, and we should acknowledge that we don't, we might be able to judge a likelihood here and there, but we could be wrong, but as moral and good people, our thoughts should be on what the possibility is. And if there is you know, a wave forward ahead of us that is possible and that is good, then we should be marching in that direction. We shouldn't stop and think, well, is this politically convenient? Is this, is this likely according to the, the, you know, what little I know about the world? Because there's so many undercurrents that are going on all the time that are invisible to us. Uh, in the case of an, the ex-Muslim movement, uh, the internet has empowered us in a way that it's hard to actually, <laughs> to actually talk about it and put it into words the way that which this community that was so isolated um, and uh, so you know disempowered and was able to find each other and find hope and you know I hear from people that are in in the most dire circumstances that have reason their way out of, of religion and are working to help other people like them. And if, you know, if people in, in Egypt and Pakistan and Saudi Arabia can do it and they can find hope and they can think that this is a world worth fighting for, then I can think that way too. So go forth and be inspired to be active in whatever it is you're doing, sir. Thank you for the question. Yes, sir. Hi, thanks. A uh, question uh, mostly for Sam, but uh, if anyone can take it. Of course. Um, Sam, you've made your uh, thoughts on free speech very clear, and I think most people here would uh, agree with you, and I agree certainly with you. Um, but I, I certainly do share Mr. Smalley's disgust for the um, white supremacist rallies uh, in the U.S. Mm. Um, question for Sam, how, to, to paraphrase you, to use your words, um, what's the ethical bedrock that you um, would use to determine whether they have the, you know, these white supremacists have the right to march and uh, is that expression of free speech and where do we put the line where we say, well, you're um, inciting too much um, hate in other people or do we use the, um, the line that we already have, which is if you're directly inciting violence or um, encouraging violence on other people, then that should not be allowed, but anything up to that point uh, is okay for us to tolerate. Yeah, you know, it's a hard question. I feel like it's hard to know where the, the line actually is there. I feel like we have it just about right in the U.S., which is erring on the side of tolerating even the most odious speech and letting it, as you say, walk right up to the line of encouraging violence. Because I think, I mean, the principle there is that the, the best way to combat this is to let it expose itself and then to show what's wrong with it, you know, to, to, to make it look ridiculous, to satirize it, to argue against it. But I think, for instance, you know, th these countries in Europe that have made it illegal to deny the Holocaust, I think that's, that's absolutely the wrong approach. Because what you do there is you, 
you, you make martyrs of the few people who, who make it their life's business to, to, to get locked up for this crime. Uh, and then you, you drive underground this ideology and this, this language game uh, that, that is inadmissible in public because you've made it illegal. Uh, and yet, and you, you don't know how many people subscribe to it, you don't know how many people are, are, are aligning with it, and you, you can't put any pressure on them apart from the pressure to not uh, make themselves known uh, for fear of consequence. So I, th I think you know, it's the sunlight is the best disinfectant principle, and I think that is, is generally true. And I, it's, it's not, I mean, I don't like seeing neo-Nazis and, and members of the KKK march you know, uh, uh, at all, and it's, it does strike me as ridiculous to see the amount of public expense that, that has to be brought forward to protect them from the people they are, are um, uh, saying that they would kill if they only had more power, uh, but it's a, um, I, think you, I think we should be very slow to use the, the violence of the state to silence speech. Uh, and, and it really has to be at the point where speech is seem, seems to be the, the proximate cause of, of, of violence itself. Just as a very quick follow-up, then you wouldn't agree with um, banning certain groups, like you wouldn't ban the KKK um, under those premises? Yeah, I, I, I just don't think that's the right lever to pull. I, I think you, you should be free to be as obnoxious and as stupid and as reprehensible as you want to be, and then the rest of us should be free to criticize you, to ignore you, to not go to your restaurant, to, I mean, just to make you, to make your life as difficult as it will be if you are expressing views that are, that are um, dangerous and divisive and idiotic. And, and that's, and so I, I think the pressure should come from society, but it, the moment you give, the, the, the moment you legislate against it, then a different machinery starts working, and then who knows what the next law is going to look like. Then you'll be, then it'll be illegal to deny the, the God because of all the pain that causes the people. You know, the majority of people believe that Jesus is coming back to Earth. Well, to deny that then is to to offend a majority of of the people in in the U.S. at least. And why not make that illegal for all the, the harm it causes? You know. I'll add one thing, it's just um, just a little point. Um, I was looking at propaganda posters um, in Weimar Germany uh, that the Nazi party put out. And it's interesting that it, there was at least three that I found, two or, or three, um, which had a, an image of Hitler and then, and then a cross over his, his, his mouth like a tape. Because actually they did try to ban him from, from speaking um, in, 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 in Germany at the time. And so the posters had this tape over his, uh, this black tape over his mouth, and it, it said something to the effect of, um, the text said something to the effect of, there's only one man who is not allowed to speak in Germany. Uh, and then the insinuation was, why don't, why don't they want, the, they, the, the people in power, want you to hear what he has to say? Uh, it's a very powerful marketing tool, uh, censure is, and it can't actually protect you from the bigotry yeah. Yeah. If you're hateful, I want to know who you are. Right. <laughs> if your views are that destructive, I, I'd like you to, I'd, I'd like right. you to show yourself and speak up. And 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 like you said, if you know, if if we start taking views that we all find despicable, but if we take those views and we classify that as step one of violence, then all of us are subject to that. Yeah. You know, then we are now as secular people. Um, somehow causing violence to people that are deconverting from Christianity or deconverting from Islam, and then now they're going to hell. That's us inciting violence in some way. Then you get on a very slippery slope. So I'm, I'm, I expected to disagree mm -hmm. with something that you said about it, and I was completely on board with that. Well, well the vast majority of progressive the movements, to too. Like, if you, if you take a look at the things that we find, you know, we celebrate today, something like, you know, like, like homosexuality, you know, gay pride, and everything like that. That's something that's part of our our ecosystem now, and that's something that's normalized now, but there was a time where it was perverse, and it was, 
it was uh, the, the devil's work, and it was something that many people would have found completely abhorrent, and they would have and, 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 and did try to, to, to ban and get rid of. So when you're looking at it from a, from a, from a scale, from a larger scale, and taking a look at human history and, and the progress of human history, there's, there's been, it's, it's hard to, 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 to know um, what, from where you are you know, exactly what would be considered the most hateful thing and what wouldn't. So you have this umbrella and or this, this large net where, where, where something that would be considered progress in the future will be caught along with the white supremacists. And you can't, you know, how can we know that? I mean, there's a deeper principle here. The, the reason why free speech strikes me as the master value is that it is the only mechanism we have to correct for our errors collectively in real time. You know, it's like if something can't be talked about, it still exists, right? And it's still operating, but we now can't talk about it. And, and, and so it's just uh, uh, the open-endedness of conversation on really every topic is the only thing I see that is getting us all to convert, you know, politically, ethically, uh, intellectually, scientifically. I mean, it's, it, everything is, is running on the same rails. and, and rails are conversation. Yeah. The moment you make something taboo, it becomes interesting. People want to know yeah. what's behind the veil. Why can't they talk about that? Over here. Hi. Um, I wanted to mention, uh, address the point about hopelessness. Um, I was, uh, my grandparents were refugees from Palestine who lived in Syria, and uh, I was born, and uh, Basically, I was living in the Middle East on the other side of the planet when I started going on the internet. Uh, when I was in grade seven, I got access to a high-speed internet and I started watching videos for Richard Dawkins and I heard about the God delusion and uh, that was kind of the age of reason to me. That was when I started learning about, uh, because I was an ex-Muslim pretty much and uh, I was in a conditioned environment that was um, taking me away from to access any sort of or any form of thing that would shatter the reality that I was living as part of in the Middle East, really. And in high school, we, uh, when my, when I was, when it was found that I was becoming atheist and a bunch of other students becoming atheists, our uh, Islamic department canceled evolution. And uh, we basically, they came after us, they kind of like wanted, they threatened us of talking about atheism again. And uh, basically, I came here. <laughs> and um, coming here to university is not also ideal, I would say, because when I come to university and I expect that I'm going to get all the critical thinking skills that I'm going to be able to ask any questions I want, I get faced by the Antifa, basically um, being the extreme left. If you disagree with socialism, you're white supremacist. And uh, that's another problem, I guess. Um, now, when it, so that's, I, I think it's a phenomenal thing that me being on the other side of the planet and make, making it here today is a dream for me to actually see you in front of me. Um, I, I'm literally gonna be texting my friends back in Qatar telling them about how amazing this event is and it's, it's, it's just phenomenal to me. Um, the point I wanted to address is the free will part. I, I agree with you. I don't believe in free will. Um, it makes me, though, depressed because I feel that, um, like, on the Charles Murray podcast, if I'm, I'm pronouncing his name wrong, right, um, it's mentioned that we don't have that much control over how much we can change ourselves in terms of genetics and ability to be more intelligent and, and change our IQ. So it makes me feel very limited and unable to be productive or do much to change anything about life in general, in, in my life, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so that point really depresses me. Um, well, and I just wanted to sort of... Can I speak uh, to that? Your point. Yeah, because that, that's, uh, that's a very common feeling about the, the conclusion that free will is an illusion. People, many people, I don't, I'm not one of them, but many people find it depressing. And uh, I don't know if I can show you the other side of it, but I, it strikes me as, uh, first of all, 
acknowledging that free will is an illusion, acknowledging that you didn't invent yourself, you didn't pick your parents, you didn't pick your genes, you didn't pick the society into which you were born, you're not responsible for your appearance in the world. And uh, even the things you, you seem responsible for in terms of the conventional responsibility, the, the, the kind of efforts you make to get things done, say, well, the amount of effort you're able to summon is also a product of your genes and your environment and, and the, the good conversations you've had or, or the ones you missed. And, and it's all just propagating forward. It's all just, you know, it's just your corner of the universe doing its thing. Uh, moment by moment, and there's no place to stand where you are the you, the subjective you, the sense of of, of uh, the experiencer in this moment. There's no place to stand where you can own the the, the the totality of those causal processes. But one thing that cuts through is you know obvious bullshit like you know white pride or really any what other do you kind mean of you pride. Say that? Yeah, right. <laughs> white pride over here. <laughs> Might, might, might be the hair, I don't know. Yeah, it must be. Um, <laughs> I knew that was coming. That no one, you, know, you, you didn't, the fact that you're born white or black or any other color is not something you're responsible for, right? So you can't take credit if you think, you know, white people are better for the fact that you're, you're one, one of them. Um, and so it's, it's nothing like that could conceivably be the basis of pride. But so it is with everything else, like intelligence, like uh, just uh, having an ability to get things done in this world. Pride is, is the wrong summary of your talents there. W gratitude is appropriate. I mean, you, what, 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 oh, what, what, when you get past, when you fully absorb the implications of there being no free will, then what you see is a world of radical differences in luck, for, for lack of a better word. I mean, you see people, there are people who are obviously incredibly lucky and people who are obviously incredibly unlucky. And insofar as you are lucky, you can feel grateful and you can feel a, a, a commitment to making the most of that luck. And again, your being, your making the most of it is more of the universe just doing its thing. It's not that that part is really you. Uh, but the, what you can recognize is that you are, you are a work in progress. There's no telling how much you can change moment to moment. A and years in the future, you have no idea what you'll be like. You'll, you have no idea what you'll be like by virtue of the relationships you form or the ideas that you have or the, the, the intense experiences that, that suddenly intrude in your life that you, you know, didn't expect. Uh, people people change radically, and they don't change. I mean, their their height doesn't tend to change. You know, they're, they're, they're things that are kind of fixed. But uh, there's it really is open. Your mind and your life is really open ended, and it is a it's a process of discovery, moment to moment. And nothing is is fixed really. Uh, nothing especially important is fixed. And so there's there's a um, I don't, I don't see it as depressing, I just see it as a, a circumstance where you can be uh, gratitude, gratitude and love and curiosity are always appropriate without free will. <laughs> so anyway, I hope so, that helps. So I know I'm going to disappoint many of you when I say we only have time for one more question. I'm very sorry about that. So talk amongst yourselves, find out who's the most important question. <laughs> no, I think we'll just go with one more right here at mic one. And, um, All right, well, um, go ahead. so I'm currently studying uh, machine learning at the graduate level. So I'm gonna right. ask you a question about AI. And uh, I'm sure many of people have, talk, have uh, listened to your TED talk. So I, I, th I believe I've heard you say that it would be truly tragic to not have any conscious beings in this universe. And as far as the linearity of time is concerned, uh, machines have a higher probability of thriving than, than us, just on a material basis. But wouldn't you say that consciousness consciousness, it would be the ultimate existential threat uh, to humanity, considering that uh, in the analogy of, of us, the, 
I, like I wouldn't say it's intelligence. I would say it's consciousness that we choose to just defy the um, the well-being of the ants because because we, we just know that we we have a dominance in our um, in our uh, just in our capacity of of, uh, of being. Mm -hmm. So right now, as far as Right now, as far as computer vision and natural language processing and uh, speech recognition, we're training them according to human benchmarks. But the thing that we should be scared about would be, to, would be for this machine to ultimately know that I really am the most intelligent being in this universe. Yeah, I mean, that's an additional concern. I think, I think the, the question of consciousness uh, Consciousness and intelligence are two different variables, and I think they're they're, they're, they're certainly separable in the, the, the near term. I don't know if they're ultimately uh, of a piece. I mean, I, I don't know if you get more and more and more intelligent up to the human level and beyond if consciousness is guaranteed to come along for the ride at some point there. I think possibly not, in which case, for me, that's the worst case scenario because it it opens the door to the possibility of us just turning the lights out in the universe. I mean, we're the only, biological life is the only theater of consciousness we know of, and if we create some mere mechanism for whom the lights are not on, and this be yet becomes the most competent and the most powerful force on Earth, and it gets away from us, and it becomes you know, fundamentally hostile to, to our thriving, uh, as is the concern, well then we, we do, we, we've created a scenario under which we could, the, the universe could go dark, essentially, and yet you'd have these super intelligent machines propagating themselves and, you know, making paper clips or doing whatever they're, they would be doing. Uh, and I don't really see the, the self-consciousness in these machines being a especially scary variable, uh, because you could, you could run the argument the other way. It would, it would be consciousness that would allow for Empathy and uh, and other good things that we would want in these super intelligent machines if they were in fact more powerful than we are. Uh, but I worry about competence more than consciousness. The, the consciousness becomes relevant on the other side, where if you're wondering about the ethical implications of building machines that can suffer, well, then you're talking about conscious machines. And if, if we knew our machines weren't conscious and, and could never be under a certain paradigm no matter how intelligent they got, well then there'd be no scope to wonder whether or not we're, we're creating a, you know, a, a hell and populating it with, with m intelligent minds that can suffer, I mean, which would obviously be a terrible thing to do, although it apparently didn't stop God from doing it. Thank you for the question. Please give a big round of applause for Travis Pengburn and Pengburn Philosophy for putting this event together. Sam Harris and Sarah Hayter. Sarah Hayter, everyone.